A Storm at Sea by George Capaccio, illustrated by Andrew Wheatcroft. Page 3. Nathaniel Benjamin Moss lay on his bunk thinking about home. Maybe his mother was right. Maybe he never should have left Massachusetts to be a cabin boy on a whaling ship. It had been only three weeks since the Amanda Pierce had set sail from Gray's Wharf in New Bedford, but already Nathaniel wondered if he had made the right decision. Page 4. The worst part, Nathaniel thought, wasn't the food, although that was horrible. It wasn't even the way the rest of the crew treated him, calling him a greenie because he had never been to sea before. No, the worst part was how much he missed his family. Page 5. The ship rolled up and over the waves. It creaked and moaned. Suddenly, a shipmate's mirror fell from its hook across the cabin and shattered. There were sailors who believed that a broken mirror brought bad luck. Nathaniel wasn't superstitious, but he was uneasy about the long voyage that lay ahead. Feeling sick to his stomach, the boy forced himself to stand up. He still had to light the lamps on deck and then help Mr. Tombe, the cook, with supper. Maybe it won't be so bad, he thought, once we get our first whale. Page 6 Nathaniel went up on deck. A steady wind was gathering force. The sun was nearly down and it was turning the ocean orange. Captain Grayshaw was taking his turn at the ship's wheel, or helm. Nathaniel liked the captain. He was a stern man from Boston, but he treated the men fairly. Nathaniel thought he was a fitting captain for one of the oldest whaling ships out of New Bedford. Page 7. After he lit the whale oil lamps along the sides of the ship, Nathaniel headed for the galley to help prepare supper. He could hear Mr. Tombe muttering, his accent getting stronger as he got madder. Mr. Tombe was from Barbados. Nathaniel knew Barbados was an island, but he knew nothing more about it, except that the ship would not sail near Barbados on its way to the Indian Ocean. Nathaniel hoped the cook's longing for home would not make him impatient with Nathaniel himself. Page 8 In the galley, Nathaniel went to work dishing, boiling hot codfish soup into bowls for the captain and officers. He could feel Mr. Tombe's icy eyes on him. Nathaniel knew he had better not spill even a drop of soup but the sea was getting rougher by the minute. Food was spilling all over the place. Without warning, <clears throat> the galley door flew open. The first mate, a tall, heavy-set man named Mr. Turner, ducked inside and slammed the door shut. Nathaniel dropped the ladle. Hot soup scalded his hand. Mr. Tombe was glaring at him. Your job is to serve the food I make the cook yelled, not waste it. All hands on deck, Mr. Turner shouted. Even you, cabin boy. There's a gale blowing. The first mate grabbed Nathaniel's arm and dragged him toward the door. Up on deck, Mr. Turner threw a jacket at Nathaniel. You and Douglas have first watch tonight. It'll be cold up there. Call out if you see a whale or another ship. Page 9 Nathaniel made his way across the deck. A frosty wind blocked him at every step. The ship rocked in the mighty waves. Suddenly, what looked like a twenty-foot wave rolled over the left side of the deck and smashed into the boy's face. Nathaniel lost his balance and fell. He grabbed the nearest mast and held on for dear life. Nathaniel knew he might have been swept overboard if not for that mast securely anchored in the middle of the ship. Page 10 Boy, a voice roared, get on your feet, I need you up here. Nathaniel raised his hand. The mainmast soared above him. He saw halfway up, 
almost lost in the rigging the unmistakable face of Mr. Douglas, the ship's blacksmith. Besides Mr. Tambe, he and Nathaniel were the only African-American sailors on board the Amanda Pierce. As Nathaniel began climbing the mast, Mr. Douglas yelled down, If we don't get these sails furled in a hurry, the wind will rip them to shreds. Nathaniel climbed faster, stepping carefully so that his feet wouldn't slip. Page 11. High above the deck, Nathaniel could feel every dip and rise the ship took in the storm. The wind shrieked as it blew across the ropes that held the sails. Nathaniel and Mr. Douglas scampered through the rigging, working as hard and as fast as they could. Nathaniel admired the blacksmith's strength and agility. Mr. Douglas was an old man, but age didn't prevent him from climbing the ropes hand over fist, and rolling up the mainsail. The two worked without speaking, but they moved smoothly, in kind of a dance. As they finished the job together, they stood side by side. Page 13. When all the sails were furled, most of the sailors went back below deck to settle in for the night. The ship's bell struck eight times. The first watch had begun and would last until midnight. To make sure the voyage was as successful as possible, the crew took turns watching for whales around the clock. Tonight was Nathaniel and Mr. Douglas's turn. Side by side, they balanced on a large rope high above the deck and leaned on a furled sail. The wind had died down, but the sea still swelled and the ship rocked end to end. Nathaniel held tight to the sail. He was glad he hadn't eaten supper. Page 14 As he scanned the horizon for whales, Nathaniel thought back to the clear, bright morning when the ship pulled out of the dock at Gray's Wharf. He would never forget the date, March 3rd, 1834, and the excitement of his leaving. He closed his eyes for a moment. Page 15 with a jolt, Nathaniel felt Mr. Douglas's weighty hand on his shoulder. Keep your eyes open, boy. You're standing watch now. Don't be drifted, drifting off. Nathaniel nodded and fixed his gaze again on the sea. The clouds had cleared and a thin moon shone on the waves. Douglas! Moss! How goes the watch? came a shout from below. Nathaniel looked down. There on the deck stood Mr. Turner. It goes well, sir, the boy shouted in reply. Aye, well indeed, yelled the blacksmith. The boy is a good companion, and able-bodied as any man on board. I wouldn't have gotten the mainsail furled without his help. Satisfied with this report, Mr. Turner walked away. Page 16 Able-bodied as any man on board. Mr. Douglas's words rang in Nathaniel's head. This was high praise, but he was eager to believe he had earned it. Nathaniel straightened up. The worst of the storm was over. The sea still swelled, but the moon held tight to the sky. For the first time since he left home, Nathaniel felt like a whaleman. The End <laughs>